Hello teammates, I'm Colonel Pat Miller, Commander of the 88th Air Base Wing and Installation Commander for Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. First, let me say thank you for joining us for another COVID Town Hall so that we can provide you an update of where Wright-Patterson Air Force Base sits today. Now, for those of you that uh, may have saw the announcement, on Friday, this past Friday, I transitioned the installation from Health Protection Condition Delta to Health Protection Condition Charlie. And again, I transitioned the installation as of Friday to Health Protection Condition Charlie. We remain under a public health emergency. That public health emergency currently runs until mid to late March. And we're going to keep that in place as we continue to transition through the different health protection condition levels as it stands right now. So why did I feel comfortable making that transition on Friday? Well, today you're going to hear a little bit about that from our public health emergency officer, Major Manning. And then Colonel Lyons, our med group commander, is going to give you an update on our medical services. And he will be followed by Lieutenant Colonel Hill, our deputy mission support group commander, to talk about impacts to different functions across the mission support group portfolio. But first, let me just scratch the surface, and then Major Manning is going to get into the details. If you recall the journey to health protection condition Delta, this started all the way back in when we were in alpha, hard to believe, when we were in alpha in June of last year. And we were only seeing five cases uh, recorded by our uh, public health team in the month of June, and that's June of 21. And then we started to see an increase in cases. Uh, and that was primarily due to that Delta variant. And we hit the peak of the Delta variant in September of 21. And we thought, man, we, we, we worked through that Delta variant. We started to see things coming back down. And then Omicron showed up. And Omicron was something like we haven't seen any time before. Highly transmissible for vaccinated and unvaccinated personnel. Uh, and that Omicron uh, really started to hit its stride. November, cases increasing. December, cases increasing. And we hit our peak in, in uh, January uh, for that Omicron variant. And that's why early January, I declared health protection condition Delta. And it was based off of those four um, measures or metrics that we use. And that is our COVID case incidence rate as reported by the COVID data uh, tracker. And that's managed and operated by the Center for Disease Control. It's based off of trending of cases. And we were seeing that trend go in the wrong direction. It's based off of percent positivity rate. And it's based off of hospital capacity. Now, folks, Delta at one point, so HBCon Delta at one point, uh, the Omicron uh, variant had uh, our surrounding four counties all above 2,000 cases uh, per 100,000 population. The threshold for OSD for health protection condition Delta was 420 cases. And so we well exceeded that, three, four, five times uh, that uh, threshold. And so as we continued on that journey, we, we needed to be in Delta. It was a recognition of the threat uh, in our surrounding area. Not necessarily the hot spots we were seeing on installation, but the threat in the surrounding area. And so we needed to do the right thing to acknowledge that threat. Fortunately, since about mid to late January, we saw that starting to come down. We peaked, uh, one of our counties peaked at around 2,300 cases per 100,000. That's significant. As a matter of fact, percent positivity, we were seeing in the ranges of 30 to 40 percent. Again, significant. But most alarming to me was hospital capacity. We were seeing our hospitals stressed. Uh, we were seeing uh, emergency rooms uh, holding patients, uh, you know, because they couldn't transition to other bed spaces. And so it was a tough time. But now, over the past couple of weeks, we saw all of that coming back down and coming down fast. Uh, as a matter of fact, we went from that peak of about 2,300 uh, down to one of our counties at about 160 as of today. Uh, as a matter of fact, the range of our counties today is like 160 to 240. Uh, that's our surrounding four counties. And so if you look at that in terms of health protection condition levels, uh, we're firmly in Charlie and actually we're starting to get on the low er lower end of Charlie. And one of those four counties, one of our surrounding four counties, uh, is actually in health protection condition Bravo Plus range. And so we're trending in the right direction. We're seeing our new cases really come down. As a matter of fact, this time last month, we had our public health team was tracking over 1,100 new cases uh, for folks that work on the installation or for our dependents or retirees that were tested by our COVID screening line. Today, we're at about 220, right? Again, just a huge difference between where we were last month. Uh, more importantly to me, our hospital capacity in our local community 
uh, is getting much better, much better. And so huge thank you to all of our community partners out there working in the medical uh, business. Uh, you uh, had your work cut out for you, not just over the course of the last year and a half, but really over the course of the last uh, month or two. Uh, and so thanks uh, for taking care of our families. Thanks for taking care of our friends. Thanks for taking care of our teammates. And we're thrilled to see us on the other side of this Omicron uh, variant and doing much, much better. Hopefully you get a little bit of breathing space uh, as we uh, continue to trend in the right direction. And so for those reasons, I felt comfortable making this transition to health protection condition Charlie. And we continue to watch the numbers, those same four parameters, COVID incidence rate, uh, new case trending, percent positivity rate, and uh, hospital capacity to see if and when we can make the transition to the next, uh, next level, that Bravo Plus. Uh, and so we're keeping an eye on that. That's around your 210, 211 mark uh, for cases uh, per 100,000 uh, for our surrounding communities. Uh, and as I look at it, like I said, one of, our four is, one of our four surrounding counties is already there. And a matter of fact, moving out to the next second ring, those the nine counties uh, surrounding Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, uh, those four counties, uh, those nine, four of those nine are in Bravo Plus range. And the other five, are in that low end of the Charlie range. So we're getting there, folks. And that's due to the hard work of you. Being safe, wearing your mask, getting vaccinated, maintaining that physical distance, doing the right thing on and off base. And so thanks for that. Uh, I'm gonna step away. I'll let uh, Major Manning do a little bit more of a deep dive in there, talk about some of the services. What does Charlie look like for us? How do we get to Bravo Plus? And then he'll hand it over to Colonel Lyons, who will in turn hand it over to Colonel Hill, and then I'll come back and wrap it up. And so I appreciate you being with us. And uh, let me step off and let Major Manning jump in. Thank you, Colonel Miller and uh, the wing leadership team for having me here. Uh, and uh, good evening, Team Right Pat. So one of the things we wanted to discuss is what exactly health protection condition Charlie looks like. And as the boss said in his email that he sent out on Friday, we shouldn't expect to see a lot of change because we have been doing such a good job of being a kind of a bubble in the middle of this COVID storm because we are wearing our masks and we are getting uh, our folks vaccinated. So a few of the things that you can expect to see is we're going to continue to wear our masks and do our social distancing efforts that we have been doing so far. That includes washing your hands frequently. We're going to continue to screen our unvaccinated personnel. And if you are sick, please stay home and get tested so we can know what is best to do for you and make sure that we can get you the care that is so trusted here at the 88th Medical Group. We're going to optimize telework. And uh, for all those who have asked many questions about it, the fitness center operations are open to eligible patrons. There are some uh, capacity limitations. So for uh, the Jarvis and Dodge gyms, that's going to be 100 max capacity and 200 max for the right field fitness center. Uh, for those of us who are subject to fitness testing, that is back on as well. So in general, the thing that you need to understand too is that uh, our, we're kind of coming back into the swing of things, but we're going to keep our occupancy to about 25% of what it would uh, be pre-pandemic levels. And we're going to do that by following the guidelines that Colonel Miller sent out in his, his message to the entire base. Uh, DFACs are going to be restored to normal operations. Um, with limiting uh, their seating capacity. And then other base food establishments will also continue to offer their services with limited capacity for seating as well. And chapel services are going to be back to in-person. So we are really helping to get the base moving back to, to really good things. And a lot of those measures we're going to continue to see going on because they are the proven measures of mask wear, vaccination, social distancing that limit the spread of the disease, regardless of our health protection condition. But as Colonel Miller alluded to, we are coming down so rapidly, we may get to a point where we could go into uh, Bravo Plus health protection condition. So that, as he said, was 210 cases per 100,000. You know, and we're getting really close to that. Now, what is that going to look like when we get there? What's going to change? Well, a lot of those guidelines are going to stay in place, right? We're going to still continue to, to screen our unvaccinated, do good hygiene, wear our masks, but we'll be able to increase our gathering capacities up to uh, around 40 percent. So we're going to be able to get more of us back together, which is what everybody would like to see happen. And those are going to be the main changes that you'd see at that time. The biggest uh, takeaway, though, is that we will have gathering guidelines that come out as, that, as we enter to that realm. 
One of the main questions that we get asked uh, very frequently is, is in regards to masking. There are lots of questions about why we wear a mask, should we have to wear a mask, when we can unmask our kids, and when we can unmask ourselves. There are studies as back as far as 2008 that show that wearing masks in public reduced the spread of respiratory illness. This was long before COVID became a thing and uh, that it is in also directly related to the amount of the population that wears a mask. So just to show you how well mask wear works for us in COVID-19, if you wear a cloth face mask, there's a 56% reduction in transmission. If you wear a surgical mask, the ones you see your doctors wear, there's a 66% reduction. And then if you wear a respirator like a KN95 or an N95 respirator, it's an 83% reduction in you getting sick from COVID-19. So we are seeing a lot of good efficacy from us wearing our mask wear. It is not a silver bullet, but as we combine our, our multifaceted approach, this is one of the great tools we have to keeping our installation open, running, and meeting its mission. Stopping wearing masks too early is a lot like stopping taking your antibiotics before your course is through. It doesn't actually solve the problem. The OSD has given us an order to follow the CDC guidelines as far as mask wear goes. That order has us wearing masks when we are in substantial and high transmission rates. So everybody knows what that looks like. That means we have to have less than 50 cases per 100,000 on a seven day average for the, the wing to consider being able to remove mask wear. And currently we are sitting at you know, between 160 and 240 cases in our surrounding counties. So we're not quite there yet, but it continues to be monitored as we go. And we continue to make sure that we can give the care that is uh, needed at the medical group. Uh, thank you for your time. Colonel Lyons, over to you. Thanks so much, Major Manning. I appreciate the, the great work of you and the team. And I just want to echo what uh, Colonel Miller said. Uh, thank you so much for all of our great caregivers out there in our community, uh, certainly in our medical center, who have uh, seen us through the, the surge of the Omicron variant. Uh, and I, th I think we've done well to fight the good fight, but it has been a tough one. And so I'm glad we're uh, seemingly on the backside of that. But that's going to take uh, continued vigilance and continued assistance from everybody. So we appreciate all the help and support, certainly for our medical center and all the caregivers that are out there. Thank you. Um, I want to take a little bit of a different uh, orientation, and that is talk a little bit about on the medical front what you can expect to see from the medical center, uh, because some of our operations have and will change here, um, given what has happened over the course of the past month and what we, what we see going to the future. So I kind of want to take a moment to talk to you about some of the decreases in services that you may see in the upcoming months. In truth, uh, our mighty medics have been trusted uh, to support multiple medical support teams across the nation. We just had a medical support team that returned from Muskegon, Michigan, and we have three other teams that uh, have gone to Oklahoma, to Massachusetts and to Maine uh, to support medical systems in our community um, that are struggling. And so FEMA has come upon us to call upon our support. Uh, I think because they train our expertly trained, uh, excuse me, they respect and they, um, they trust our expertly trained medics uh, to go out and support uh, members in our community. And our mighty medics are very proud to go support citizens of our nation uh, and help those who are, are struggling still with the COVID surge that we have seen here, certainly over the past uh, month and a half or so. Uh, but that does uh, require that we've had to take uh, direct caregivers out of our mission set and that limits what we can do as an organization. Further, we stand ready if called upon uh, to deploy members across the globe uh, in supportive operations for any kind of a emerging situation uh, that may be upon us. Again, as we anticipate that we may deploy multiple folks at the end of the month, uh, two, we, have, we may see even further reduction of services. So what does that look like? Uh, in truth, uh, the number of our inpatient beds has decreased by about 50%. We'll remain that way for a little bit. Our surgical capacity is limited to urgent and emergent uh, cases only. Uh, our outpatient services uh, are still open and are still there to serve our beneficiaries, but you no may notice a decrease in your access to, to care availability or an increase in that time to get your appointment. 
really the only uh, places where you might not see impacts uh, to our care is in our dental and pediatrics clinics who continue to work hard to serve our community. But our primary focus is on military readiness and making sure that we have ready medics to go and deploy wherever we're called upon, but also to make sure that we maintain our mission set here for the Wright-Patterson installation. And so we'll be fo focusing many of our efforts there. Uh, so to offset kind of our, our posture and what we've been forced to do to support the nation, um, our community par partners have certainly rallied uh, to help us. They've streamlined many uh, aspects of transfer of patients uh, to the facility, and they've opened our doors to take our beneficiaries. And we cannot say thank you enough uh, to those members of the Greater Dayton Area Hospital Association who are always rallying to support uh, the Wright-Patterson installation. But some ways that our beneficiaries can access care, given our reduction of services that we've been experiencing and will experience here in the upcoming future, um, we, in, we encourage people for acute care needs to visit an urgent care center. Now, for our military members, that will require a referral for those folks to go down to urgent care centers, but we're encouraging people for acute care needs, so new, what you say, what you uh, are concerned about conditions to go to an urgent care center. Now, if you have a truly emergent condition, something that's related to life, limb, or, or eyesight, or something that you feel is a truly emergency need, then we uh, encourage you to visit the closest emergency room. Uh, if you have questions about your care or which direction that you should go, the best place to contact is our nurse advice line. And there's a couple ways to do that. You can do that online at mhsnurseadviceline.com, or you can call 1-800-TRICARE. Now, we still have been receiving questions related to COVID vaccinations, and for our military members and for children's ages 5 to 12, so those uh, receiving pediatric doses, you should call 257-SHOT to schedule your appointment. But for non-military members, uh, for our other beneficiaries, we encourage you to use the local community uh, to access COVID vaccinations. This has to do with uh, the use of Purple Cap Pfizer vaccine that we currently have in reserve and use those for service members that need it not only our installation, but across the DOD. We're holding those appropriately. There is no difference between the purple cap, which is a undiluted form of the Pfizer vaccine, and the gray cap, which is a diluted form of the, of the Pfizer vaccine. Unfortunately, the gray caps are just not available to us now. So that is the why of the limitation for that. So we encourage folks who still need to have a COVID screening to use our 5-2 COVID line. We found that to be uh, very helpful to many of the folks who have called in. You can call, leave a message, and our team will get back to you as soon as possible to make sure to schedule your COVID screening uh, if indeed you think that you have symptoms related to COVID. I want everybody to rest assured that our Mighty Medics are certainly committed uh, to providing uh, trusted care to you, to your loved ones, to all of our beneficiaries. Um, but realize, too, that right now we're faced with supporting the nation in multiple capacities, and we're proud to do so. We thank you for your support and everything that uh, you have given back to uh, our medical center. Uh, and we certainly thank the support of our community partners uh, as we provide the best realm of care possible to all. With that, I'll turn it over to Lieutenant Colonel Hill, the Deputy Mission Support Group Commander. Thank you. So good evening, Team Wright Pat. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Robertson Hill, Deputy Mission Support Group Commander. And so today I want to take an opportunity to quickly highlight what HPCon Charlie means to our services posture. And I'm going to start with AFES, who is a big or a key player uh, or partner uh, with the uh, Mission Support Group and really the installation. So you should be viewing a slide right now which highlights some information with regards to AFES and the operations that we have going on the installation. Bluff up front. AFES is open, ready for business, and they also have dine-in options. But the theme you will notice throughout my brief is that limited hours, days of, oper days of operation changing, cancellation of some of our activities, which is a direct result of our challenges when it comes to our manpower shortages. So as a key partner and to continue offering some outstanding services to our installation, I also want to share with you another chart on behalf of AFES. Um, so they're looking for some highly motivated individuals to join their team. So I encourage you to log on to their Facebook page to gain some additional information on their hiring, whether it's for you, a dependent, or even someone who is looking for employment. 
Also encourage you to check out the shopmyexchange.com where you can also win some very nice prizes via their sweepstakes. Another plug, and making sure everyone is aware, AFI shopping is now available for our government employees or civilian employees to include firearm sales, military star card opportunities with approvals, and you can also get up to 10 to 15% off your first purchase. So again, take, take advantage. The majority of our other four support dining options will be open with limited operations. This means that our hours of operation may be modified based on our base staffing or our customer foot traffic. Our restaurants will have limited seating available to accommodate our patrons. So I highly recommend that you tune into our For Support webpage as well as our Facebook page to uh, make sure you see what's open and what's closed. If a facility is closed, I'm most sure that it's closed because of our, our actual manning issues, our staffing issues, as COVID has severely impacted our staffing. However, we are constantly brainstorming how we can continue to bring first-rate services to you in the community. Now, as I move on, I'm going to talk about fitness centers. This slide that you're reviewing for fitness centers should be our operating hours as well as our cleaning times. You will also notice that our patron prioritization list. Please note that all of our categories, all four of categories, are welcome to our fitness centers. However, if it becomes a concern with regards to capacity levels, my staff will follow the highlighted prioritization uh, guidelines as directed. Also, fitness assessments, as uh, Major Manning had alluded to, has resumed for Charlie. However, I want to clear up, make sure everyone understands that there was no exemptions given during Delta for fitness assessments. It was simply a pause. Some individuals may find themselves in a past due status, so I recommend that you work with your commander, contact your, your unit fitness program manager to schedule assessment and work with your PTL. Next, I'm going to discuss your child development centers and school care facilities. They are open and will continue to operate within the public health emergency officer recommended ratio and guidance. Parental, uh, parental visits and interactions will be limited to brief drop off and pickup. And to be honest, our CDCs have been taxed hard by COVID and it's taking a toll, which is one of the reasons why we're starting to reduce or even we are forced to consolidate some of our classrooms in order to stay open. However, our staffing levels they will improve and eventually our enrollment for facility capacity will in improve as well. With that said, we also are always looking for highly motivated care caregivers for our, to join our team, ensuring that we maintain the gold standard care for our littles that our customers have been accustomed to. Our goal is to remain transparent and over communicate with our customers. In doing so, our parents who have opt to pause their child care during Delta at no charge were notified earlier this week and with the return of Charlie. And of course, there was a grace period offered for the their, their fee continuation. Lastly, we understand that there are some ongoing concerns with regards to our mask mandates as it relates to the CDC. Uh, current DOD policy issued on 13 May of last year continues to mandate unvaccinated personnel two years and older must wear their mask with installation. You grab me that drink right there. Right behind you, thank you. I'm gonna pause for a moment and take a quick drink so you can hear and understand what I'm saying. So back to what I was saying with regard to the mask, understand there are always concerns with wearing masks, but we're doing the best that we can to make sure that we remain open and providing quality care. So in addition to our heightened HPCon Charlie measures, it also required that our masks be worn for vaccinated and unvaccinated personnel during the pandemic and the public health emergency that we're currently experiencing. So until we reach health PCON zero, our changes, or if there's changes to mask mandates, have to be made by DOD or the installation level. So with that said, the mask wear requirement in our child care facilities and care facilities across the installation will remain in, in effect. Use of these measures have been a key component of public health approval for our retention of full capacity in our classrooms. Honestly, it allows us to provide the care that you guys so desperately need so you can carry on the mission set. And as always, we appreciate your patience. So I'll conclude by speaking about the ID card customer support. Hours of operation that you may see on the slide behind you or behind me, 7, uh, 7.30 to 3 o'clock. We are currently appointing appointment only. Every, every Monday, military personnel flight will release appointments for the following Monday and the following Tuesday. 
During this release, the MPF will also release appointments all the way out from 60 to roughly 70 days out. We believe that this will offer the most flexible flexibility to our customers who are looking for those immediate or near-term appointments. But when we go 60 to 70 days out, we're going for those who are, have less and urgent needs. This course of action, we also believe that is, is more beneficial to our customers because it keeps you out of standing in lines for long periods of time in inclement weather. So we, we see, we hear your, your, your comments, we, we're taking your feedback, and we take it seriously to the point where our mission support group commander has initiated a continuous process improvement plan where it's going to help us identify trouble areas and the implemented strategies will allow us to ultimately improve our services across the board. So again, I'd like to thank you for uh, taking the time to listen to what we have to say today. And again, your feedback is always welcomed. And thank you for your patience. Over to Colonel Miller. Hey, thanks, teammates. Truly appreciate all of the updates. Uh, as you can see, uh, HP Con Charlie is a good thing. Uh, we are making uh, uh, some adjustments to our programs that are out there. Uh, you know, some key highlights uh, that you that you heard about today. Uh, fitness center access. I hear about that all the time. Uh, and so, uh, initially uh, in Delta, we we kind of uh, ratcheted it down to military only. About a week and a half later, we opened it up to allow our civilians and dependents, uh, and now our retiree base uh, is allowed back into our fitness centers. Uh, and I, I will tell you, working out in the fitness centers this week, I'm hearing a lot of excited folks, uh, excited to be back in there, seeing their friends, uh, working on their health, uh, trying to get after those New Year's resolutions. And so, welcome back. I'm also excited to see fitness assessments uh, starting uh, back up. I know a few folks that have already tested this week. I've got mine coming up in April, uh, and so I'll, uh, I'll be ready for that and excited to, to knock that out uh, for another year. Um, chapel services, you, you see uh, Catholic and Protestant services are also coming back uh, in in residence at limited capacity. And that's the key in Charlie, folks. Uh, we want to provide you the strength through support that you deserve. Uh, we're working hard to keep the missions going. Uh, we're also working hard to take care of you and your families. Uh, and so we will, we will be opening things up, uh, but the key theme you'll see across them is potentially limited capacity. We still need to do the right things, uh, things that we have proven worked. Uh, and physical distancing is one of those things, maintaining good spacing, especially in some of those operations like eating operations where the mask has to come down while you're eating. And so that spacing is critical uh, to keep folks safe. Now, uh, you've heard a lot of positive movement uh, and we're celebrating uh, the transition from Delta to Charlie. Uh, I will tell you, uh, Charlie is still serious business though. Uh, Charlie is still high risk. As a matter of fact, if you go to the CDC COVID data tracker and you pull up the state of Ohio, the vast majority of the state is still red, right? And there's a reason. It's still high community risk transmission. Uh, and this is why we still need to follow the basic blocking and tackling of mitigating measures, of wearing that mask, of maintaining that physical distancing, of practicing good hygiene, of optimizing our telework. And that's what the public health emergency declaration gives us the ability to do a little bit more flexibility and supervisors directing folks to telework to keep you safe and to keep the mission going. Uh, to ensure if you're not feeling well, you're not coming to work and you're getting tested. Uh, get vaccinated. Uh, I'm proud to say that 97% of our military teammates and 91% of our civilian teammates are fully vaccinated. Because when you look at our surrounding uh, four communities, uh, those vaccination rates uh, for the surrounding four communities range in the 50 to 60%. And if you go to booster shots, uh, we're down in the 40% for those surrounding four communities. And so getting vaccinated, you're doing the right thing there. And for those that, that, aren't unvac or that are unvaccinated, uh, the way we mitigate that risk is through screening testing, right? And so we're doing what we can to keep the team safe, to mitigate the risk and to prevent the spread on installation. And what we see on installation is we're a bit of an island in the community. Uh, the cases that we're seeing are not based off of hot spots on base, but what folks are getting uh, through transmission off installation, large gatherings, big events, those types of things. And so we continue to reduce gatherings to that 25% or less in HBCon Charlie because it's still a serious threat. And so, yep, we're happy to make the transition from Delta to Charlie, but recognize Charlie's still very real, very serious, and we have mitigating measures in place, uh, but we're trying to do the best that we can to provide the services that you so rightly uh, deserve. So I ask you uh, to continue to get after it. 
uh, and we will continue to advocate uh, for updated guidance. Uh, you heard uh, Lieutenant Colonel Hill talk about uh, the CDC guidance and OSD guidance that was based back in May. And we recognize the situation has evolved, and we continue to engage senior leadership to make sure that we continue that keep that question on the front burner, right? Uh, but if you want to know when masks uh, come off, keep an eye on that COVID uh, data tracker. Uh, whenever those counties turn to blue or yellow, that's when we can get to the masks off. Uh, but per OSD guidance, if those counties are orange or red, which is substantial or high risk, we wear the masks. And so there are metrics out there that you can keep an eye on to try and figure out when we're going to get there. Uh, it, it is great to start to see Ohio uh, on the CDC COVID data tracker not have all of their counties in red. As a matter of fact, if you look up in that Cleveland area, there are nine counties up that way that are orange. So they're starting to progress down through the color scheme. Uh, and we typically lag about a week or two uh, behind the Cleveland area. And we mentioned already, we're seeing the numbers drop pretty fast. Uh, and so who knows, we could be in orange soon and fingers crossed, we keep heading in that right direction, uh, get to a yellow, and then we can start to, uh, to look at the mass stuff. But we recognize guidance is evolving. CDC is always looking at the Center for Disease Control is always looking uh, at the different recommendations out there. OSD feeds off of the uh, CDC. So if you hear something coming out of the CDC, odds are OSD, the Office of Secretary of Defense, uh, DOD Big, uh, is looking at that, evaluating that, and then they will update guidance uh, pushed out to the installations through the Air Force, and then we will go ahead and make those transitions. And so there's a bit of a hierarchy to try and make sure we are protecting missions and protecting teammates. And that's what the focus is. It's all about you. Uh, and so we do these mitigating measures for a reason. Uh, I will pause there uh, and just to see uh, if the PA team has any questions for us. Sir, we do. We do have a couple of medical questions, sir. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what. I will step out and let the experts step in. So, Colonel Lyons, uh, all you. Thank you, sir. Hey, sir, first question. Uh, what is DOD's position on booster shots, and do booster shots alter the term fully vaccinated? Thanks. That's a great question. Um, fully vaccinated still means that a person has received a primary series of the COVID-19 vaccines. So let's say, for example, the Pfizer vaccine that we've been distributing, it's the two doses of the Pfizer vaccine. To be considered up to date on COVID-19 vaccination means that a person has received all the recommended doses of the COVID-19 vaccines, including the booster dose of the vaccine. Uh, so we do know and we try to encourage the folks that being up to date on, on your COVID-19 vaccination is going to provide you the greatest protection. Sure, thank you. Uh, sir, second question. Um, why are unvaccinated employees singled out for COVID testing on a weekly basis even if they have no symptoms? Yeah, that's, thank you very much. That's a great question. Um, it, it comes down to risk management. So we know that those folks who have not been vaccinated are much more likely to have more severe forms of the disease. This includes those folks who may have previously had a, co a COVID a infection. Folks who are vaccinated still are much less likely to have severe illness if they're vaccinated, even if you've had COVID-19 previously. So what the home test kits do is they provide a way for us to identify those folks who may be sick with COVID illness. Those folks who are using the home test kits and they're using them correctly per the manufacturer's guidance. Um, we have high sensitivity and specificity of identifying COVID illness if it's present. So it's a good way for us to identify potential of COVID illness in those folks who have been unvaccinated, who we know will, who are at greatest risk for more severe disease related to COVID. Sir, thank you. That's a final question, sir. Thank you. With that, I'll turn it over to Colonel Miller. Thanks, sir. Yeah, I appreciate it, Colonel Lyons. Um, you know, I could I could always uh, take a shot at those, but uh, whenever we've got the experts in the room, I'd much rather put them in front uh, and take those questions. But uh, at the end of the day, it's all about risk mitigation. Uh, and we're trying to do the best we can, again, to protect the team, protect the mission, uh, and, and continue pressing forward. And I will tell you, uh, you're doing a great job at it. Uh, you know, what I am proud of is, uh, you know, we're, we're watching the Winter Olympics right now. We're seeing a lot of great uh, athletes compete uh, representing their countries. Uh, I'm proud of the athletes, uh, the, the all-stars, the amazing folks, the gold medal winners uh, that we have across this installation uh, that are delivering uh, huge victories each and every day. Uh, and so I, I wish I had a real gold medal that I could put uh, around every one of, those ne every one of their necks uh, to say thanks uh, and congratulations because you're absolutely crushing it. Uh, you know, you heard 
heard about some of our Mighty Mechs deploying across the U.S. in support of uh, federal emergency management uh, agency operations. Uh, and then we've got Mighty Medics here in our medical facility taking care of uh, you and your families holding down the fort. We've got uh, folks uh, at the gates and the fire department, and we've got folks interacting with the community, uh, all here to take care of you all here to make sure that we are executing the mission in support of our nation. Uh, and uh, we're watching world events, we're seeing what's going on, and we, need, and we know that we need to be ready uh, at a moment's notice. You never know when that call is going to come in. And that's why we do this. That's why it's so important that we're following the, the basic mitigating measures. Because if we get that call that our nation needs us, either on the home front or abroad, we're ready. Right? It's all about being ready to get after it uh, and know that if the nation calls you to serve, it's time to serve, just like we serve each and every day back here. We're running missions from this installation, and we're ready to support missions downrange, whatever that downrange looks like. Uh, and so I appreciate you sticking with us. Uh, these past couple months were tough as we rolled into HBCon Delta. Uh, but like I said, HBCon Charlie, it's a little bit easier but we still need to maintain the, the basic measures uh, that we have out there. Wear that mask, maintain that physical distance, but stay socially connected. That's important to get us through this. Practice good hygiene. Keep those hand sanitizers around, wash your hands, use soap, do all those things you need to do. If you're not feeling well, please stay home and get tested. Get checked out. You never know what's uh, going on, uh, and you don't want to pass that on uh, to a teammate uh, in the office space or to a, or to a loved one at home. Uh, and so make sure you get checked out. Um, but most importantly, keep showing up. Keep getting after it. I know this is hard, uh, but together uh, we're going to be able to uh, continue to beat this thing back. Just like we've made the transition from Delta to Charlie, we're going to make that transition from Charlie to Bravo Plus. Uh, and I think uh, we're going to do that soon. So keep getting after it. Thanks for all that you do. If there's anything we can do better to provide you the strength and support that you deserve, let us know. We're here to serve you. Thanks, teammates.